great-grandparents or grandparents came from India on a boat somewhere in the late 1890s, early 1900s, we're not exactly sure, made their way to Guyana for a better way of life. And uh, in that, my dad came to Canada back in the late 60s and got a white woman pregnant, a German woman, whose father was a Nazi soldier in World War II, who was a racist, extreme prejudice. And uh, my grandmother had to uh, hold, uh, not tell my grandfather for eight months that my mom was pregnant. Not only was she pregnant at a young age and not married, but she has a different color man's, a different baby in her belly that is not white. How do you think that went over? <laughs> you know, Benny, on my mom's side of the family, didn't want her to marry my dad or even have a brown baby. And, and I remember growing up knowing that there was a side of my family that didn't like us because of the color of our skin. My mom, you know, married my dad against the will of her family and her some of her family, not everybody rejected or was against it. But I remember the conversation growing up and always feeling like I was different. You see, interracial marriage isn't as popular today as it was back in the 70s. And, you know, you know and I say, when I say popular, I mean it wasn't mainstream. You know, so can you imagine going to parents' night at school with a white mother when you're brown? And I know some of you are like, I'm just trying to figure out what you are. You're like sort of cream, light, like, you know, a little bit of mixture. It depends on how much milk you put in the coffee cup. <laughs> you know, so white mom, hey, this is my, this is the 70s. This is my mother as a young boy. And always thinking like, this is sort of cool on some regard. And then when my dad would come in the picture and, you know, I'd go, how come I'm not as dark as him? And as a young child, you're trying to figure out, you know, how come you're not one or the other? Or you're sort of like in between. But, you know, I'll never forget growing up, experiencing a number of different words, derogatory terms and words that people would use to describe me. And usually it would be the P word because they associated me with being more South Asian than they did white or anything else. And as I grew up, those are the things that, you know, my parents try to educate us and help us understand and to grow into. And then when, uh, you know, I'm the second of five, um, and then my brother started dating a black girl, my older brother. Now, you need to understand, this is where the guy in East Side kicks in. Because in Guyana, there's been a civil war between blacks and, uh, and, and Indians for years. So black people don't like Indian people. Indian people don't like black people. And here my brother is marrying a black Trinidadian or dating a black Trinidadian. Well, do you know what that did on the guy in East Side? He's dating one of You see, in church, we don't use those words, the N-word, the P-word, the C-word, the H-word. We're a little bit more polished than that. We just use those people, them. <laughs> well, I don't know why, because if we were to use those derogatory words, then that would put me in a category of being a racist. And I'm not a racist because I'm saved. I love Jesus. I would never use that, but I would say them because that keeps me out of the hot water. That keeps me out of the racist boat. That keeps me out of the prejudice boat because of them. Oh boy, what did I get myself into? And this is the kicker that happened. This is all around me, different layers of this impacting my life. I'll never forget my sister-in-law, my older brother's wife, uh, gets a call one day from the school. Mrs. Prasad, will you please come to the school? My nephew was four years old and the only black child in his school. It was out in Whippy, 2002, four years old. And one of the teachers who was white, and I know I'm being very frank and very open and honest with you here today, but I believe God wants to get to, not the, the issue of racism, but the issue of anger and how we're to respond in all areas of our life. But I'm tackling this because it's an, it, it's an area very personal to me. And she says, Mrs. Prasad, 
just need to make you aware that your son doesn't receive the same care like the other children. So my sister-in-law, a little bit perplexed, says, oh, what, are you, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Mrs. Prasad, uh, sometimes during activities and other things, the other children or certain teachers exclude your son. And I just needed to make you aware of it. Well, my sister-in-law and my brother pulled my nephew out of that school so fast. Four years old. Four years old. What did he do? Now, I know this is a very sensitive issue because we all face injustice or different types of emotion and feelings based on what we've experienced in life. I know what it's like to be stopped by the police with groups of friends, question why we were stopped with no answer. I know what it's like when I was in high school, in my grade 12 year, Pickering High School, we went through a, a racial war. They shut down every school in Durham region from Pickering all the way up to Oshawa, put them on lockdown. I'll never forget the day they still allowed us to come to school. 32 police cruisers, they blocked off every street. Some of you been out in Ajax, Church Street and Highway 2. Nobody could get into the school unless you were a student. They chain locked every door for those students that wanted to go in and to their classes. Every bus was pulled off the street. We had helicopters in the air. We had police over at the Pickering Town Center and at other uh, go station stops because they knew that Jane and Finch gang was coming in through relationship. They knew the skinheads were coming from Oshawa and they knew that the white supremacists were coming from Uxbridge. And I had friends say to me in that moment, so where do you stand? What side do you take? And I said, I take no sides. Because they knew what my ethnicity was. And there's many times we're put in positions to take sides. So I'm at a place in my life knowing that I'm a believer. So if anybody were to ask me when it comes to racism and when it comes to injustice, what side I take, I take God's side. I take nobody's side. But we need to understand this issue incites a, a lot of feelings on the inside here. What is our response as Christians to anger? Do we get angry? Do we pick it? Do we speak up? Do we rant on social media? Do we have marches? Do we hurt those who hurt us? Do we spew out things that hurt other people? Do we post things online? And welcome to those that are watching online today as well. This is something that touches all of us or many of us. Whether it's through our heart attitude, what we've experienced, or what we portray on others. It amazes me that Pastor Morgan and Sister Morgan would start a church here. And here we are 36 years later, a multicultural church led by, started by white pastors. Taken over by white pastors. And a multicultural place where we can come and worship together. Appreciate each other's differences. Maybe not like each other's differences or the different things we have in our culture. But is that a hard attitude? Is it the way Jesus would respond? Is it what we should do with those people? You see, in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 and 10, the Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked and desperately sick. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and his intention, the intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I want to say this to you very clear. When a little baby grows up, they get taught how to be racist or to, or to show preferential treatment towards others. Because the heart of man is desperately wicked. And we need to completely surrender our heart and our lives to Christ on a daily basis when we're confronted by things. You see, this issue of racism has, you know, has charges me and I put great faith, and this is where faith and anger come in, because I could allow what's happening in society or these issues to get me so angry and to post things on social media and to, uh, you know, regret things after, but I've determined to keep my focus on who Jesus is and what God's word says and want him to respond, than I am to get involved in these things, you know, because this is what happens in our minds. This past week, Monday, we took a team to Detroit, Michigan, for the, uh, you know, for the, you know, for a conference. And Pastor Kerry had, you know, two groups of ladies in cars, great multicultural group. And then here I am with two brown guys. I'm sitting in the back seat 
And I got Sanjeev, who was on base today. He's Guyanese Indian, and LaShawn, who's Sri Lankan. And as we get up to the border crossing, I'm thinking, oh God, help me. Just a moment in time, I'm thinking like, okay, hold on. We got three brown guys in a car. All right, Lord, I'm extending my faith to make sure this goes well. See, experience, what we go through begins to play on our minds. All right? So we get to the uh, U.S. Customs. He said, sir, gentlemen, what are your citizenship? We're all Canadian. Great. Where are you going? To Troy, Michigan. For what? A church conference. Really? <laughs> and the first thing that goes to my mind is, oh, no. Detaining, going to be stuck for hours, going to be searched. You know, like, I mean, you know, like. All, not just the car, but searched, you know, it's like, you know, you get a little bit nervous about those things. And so the conversation continues. And then the customs guy says, what are y'all, priest or something? So I pipe up, I'm sitting in the back seat and I said, well, I'm a pastor. And then he turns to Sanjeev and Lashawn and says, well, what do you do? And Sanjeev says, I'm just a humble volunteer. <laughs> Now, we were bugging him. I said, you said humble servant. I'm just a humble servant. You know, it was a funny moment. You want to laugh on the inside, but you can't laugh because you know that moment. <laughs> so he turns to him and says, well, do you have a job? You know, and I'm thinking, this is going down. Oh, Lord, like, I'm, this is just not good. And, you know, so Sanjeev says, I do this. And Lashawn says, I do this. And, you, you know, and, you know, the conversation is happening. And how long are you going to be there? And whatever else. And then. There's that pause moment, the customs, looking at our stuff. And then he looks away like this for a moment. And I thought, oh, no. God, I begin to pray in the Holy Spirit on the inside. Oh, God. Shanda, oh, just it. It's okay, gentlemen. Have a great trip. Woo. I know you. Depending on the circumstance you face and what you've experienced in your life, that is what something that might go through your mind in a story like that. You see, because racism has touched my life and prejudice and preferential treatment and these types of things, I've got to catch myself in moments to not let my mind wander and go different places. Hey, wouldn't it be great I just could have thought about, hey, we're three short guys in a car. Wouldn't that have been great? Because we're all about the same height. <laughs> but my mind automatically went to brown because I've been detained twice at the border already in years past with no explanation. Because the last time I was with another brown guy and he stumbled in his words and we both got pulled in. <laughs> and then when Pastor Carrie and I got married because it was her car under her maiden name and she's white, you know, we, we would get pulled over every single time. And can you imagine, I'll never forget on a couple of occasions, I'm driving, the car's in your maiden name still and the customs officer has the audacity to say, ma'am, are you okay? Do you know what I felt like saying? Sir, ma'am, do you want me to get out of the car? Can I tell you how tall I am? Do you, she's taller than me by a quarter of an inch, so if she wants to beat me, like. And then the question was, are you bringing any firearms in? Only these, but you, you, like, I mean, you know, only these guns, right? <laughs> and it was interesting because in our conversation I was talking to the guys after and Sanjeev said my mind has never gone there I've never experienced that and he's brown too alright we're Sanjeev is he around alright you see these are the things that go through our mind and we think about that incite anger that could incite anger one of the things I love about Martin Luther King Jr. was as a man of God he was able to, to, to start a movement that was peaceful, but yet firm. I have a dream that all men are created equal in the sight of God. I don't know it completely off by heart, but man, I tell you, I respect him. And that equality was not just for black people, African Americans, it was for all. And this is why we need to stand up regardless of our race and regardless of our ethnicity and stand up together and not just take a side because we have been all created in the image of God. 
So how do we respond to this culture issue? How do we respond to other issues that incite anger, that bring and well up inside of us? You see, if we don't address our hearts, somebody say our heart. If we don't address this heart issue, the issues of anger in our heart, we will never be who God designed us to be. Nor will the church ever fulfill its mandate to be a culture changer that we have been destined to be. And together, we need to work together. So in this church, I want to encourage you. You might have been taught some things in the area of racism for attitudes and hearts, maybe things that have happened to you from a different culture. Now you've labeled everybody as bad. And you've allowed this to permeate in your heart and anger and you only remember and you're stuck. You've been stuck for years. Not liking people of certain cultures, angry and upset because of injustice. And I'm not here to diminish what you've been through. I'm not here to, you know, say that it wasn't a bad experience. I'll never forget Pastor Kerry and I were sitting with uh, bishops from the United States. And I'll never forget uh, Sister Fraser, uh, a, uh, her husband and her were pastoring in St. Louis, Missouri. And she was sharing this story at a pastor's dinner one time with us and with tears rolling down her eyes saying that she was the first busload of black students to her school. And they were yelled at and screamed at and all these other types of things. And it was real and all these years later that emotion was still there. And it's amazing because in the middle of emotion and something that was traumatic at that moment, her story still came with great grace and forgiveness. You see, I believe Jesus wants to get to the core of some things in our life to bring freedom. I know many of you have experienced painful words, life disappointments, betrayal, discrimination, favoritism, circumstances, marriage failure, job failure, whatever it might be that's left you hurt and angry. God doesn't want you to stay there. Anger is a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. I want to take us to Ephesians chapter 4 for just a couple moments in verse 26 and 27. And I'm going to be reading this from the Amplified Version because it draws this out to help us understand a few different layers of anger and what God's word says about this. It says this in verse 26, be angry, yet do not sin. King James, NIV, Amplified takes it and expands it a little bit more out of the original. Be angry at sin, at immorality, at injustice, and ungodly behavior. See, God said I can be angry. So I can go and call other people names. So I could go and throw rocks through the windows. So I could do this or do this or do that, whatever it might be. But hold on a second here. Yet do not sin. Do not let your anger cause you shame. And I see a lot of shame of believers today on, on social media. Sharing their opinion and they have no idea what the word of God says. Because they only see the mirror of life and what people say. And they've not seen the mirror of what God says. And I'm going to get into that in just a moment. Don't, do not let anger cause you to shame nor allow it to last even until the sun goes down. And do not give the devil an opportunity to lead you into sin by holding a grudge, nurturing anger, harboring resentment, cultivating bitterness. I don't know about you, but I just feel like I got shot. Poof, poof, poof. See, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart of mankind. Why? I'll explain that in just a few moments. We hold grudges, nurture anger, harbor resentment, or cultivate bitterness. It's sin. So how do we respond and allow faith to preside in our hearts and not anger? It's a little bit earlier in verses 22 to 24. It says, but just don't listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror, walking away and forgetting what you look like. I want to illustrate this for you just quickly. You see, the world defines me by what they see. They see the color of my skin. 
They might ask where I was born, what neighborhood that I was a part of. They see my height. Sometimes they see faults in me. But more than anything, the world defines me but what they see by the, by the outer shell. Nothing more, nothing less. This is who I am. And can I be honest with you? I'm glad God made me this way. I'm glad I am cream. <laughs> you need to be proud of the way that God has made you. But it doesn't stay there. You see, God's word tells me that I'm made in his image. The Bible tells me that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The Bible tells me that when God created humanity, it was good. The Bible tells me that I am above and not beneath. The Bible tells me I am more than a conqueror. The Bible tells me that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. The Bible tells me that I am God's workmanship. I am his masterpiece. And if I don't understand and get light of who God has created me to be, I will always default back to here of how people label me, define me, call me, speak to me, whatever it might be. And I will miss that when they speak to the shell, they don't know who they're really speaking to. Furthermore, the Bible also says that we're kings. We're priests. We are in this world, but not of this world. So you might see this, but I'm really not here. I am here, but I'm not here because there's someone greater on the inside that lives inside of me. And it's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And he has quickened this fleshly and mortal body. And regardless of what you say or do, but do you know what gets me angry? When I hear church people, I ain't gonna let my child marry that person. Never gonna allow them to marry someone that. I've heard pastors say it. I've heard deacons and elders and seasoned church people say it. Never will I allow my child to every, they can marry this culture, this culture. No, 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 no. no. Racism has infiltrated your heart. Prejudice, preferential treatment, and favoritism. And now you are living in the flesh and you were not living the word of God. But here's a disclaimer. We all have areas in our life that we're blind to. All areas in our life that, that's why the Bible says we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Well, I don't know why? Because there are areas of my life that are so blind that I think I'm living this way and it's okay and no problem. And the word of God gets preached on a Sunday on a sensitive issue. And the people go, I don't care what Pastor Jay says. I know only what I've experienced. So forget what this says. You don't know my experience. You're right, I don't. Depends how you value this in your life. You see, we're made in his image. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm gonna break this down. James chapter 1, 25 to 27 says this, and I want you to hear this as I, you know, as I just begin to wrap up my main section before I close. It says this in verse 25, it says, but if you keep looking steadily into God's perfect law, hold on a second. If I keep steady looking into God's perfect law, his mirror, what does it say? It says this. The, you know, perfect law, the law that sets you free. What will I have if I continue to stay looking at God's mirror? Freedom. And the law that also says, don't forget what you heard, and God, then God will bless you for doing it. Amen. When I stay focused on God's word and the mirror of his word, of who I am, I'm blessed yeah. and I'm free. Some of you have been living in bondage for too long. 
feelings of anger and resentment towards a, a spouse, a failed marriage, a, a relationship, uh, people that have betrayed you, misused you, stabbed you in the back, whatever it might be, circumstances. Maybe parents didn't raise you in the way that you thought they should have raised you. Raised you. There's a number of things. You know, you know, maybe you were left off that team and that coach, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, took advantage of you. You know, maybe that contractor took advantage of you and still you're angry because they robbed you of your money. And every time you see them, think about them or talk about them as nasty. I'm free and I'm blessed when I see God's mirror because I am reminded I'm his image, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, I'm good that I'm a conqueror I'm a king, I'm a priest, and I'm blessed. Amen. You see, if you always, if you're not willing to surrender your heart and your life in the area of anger, you will always remain stuck. And some of you have gone to counseling, some of you have gone to the pastor or pastors and all these things, and those are not bad things. Those are good things that we provide as a church as well, you know, for people that are wrestling through life circumstances and issues. There is absolutely nothing wrong. Let me just share this with you. There was a time in my life when I was in ministry, I spent five months in counseling to deal with some anger issues. Yeah. I'll never forget. The pastor that was speaking to me said, I don't think you're crazy, but I think you need to see a different perspective. And I resisted going to Christian counseling for another five months. And I'll tell you, the first counseling session, I'll never forget, I wept like a baby. My counselor was amazing. In five months, I felt like I was free. They walked me through practical things, helped me to see things a little bit different. And it was a Christian counselor and allowed the word of God to just hit me from all different sides. So I just encourage you in that. You see, God wants us to be free. What are some ways that we can be free? You see, we need to understand before I share these three things with you, it takes faith to believe what God says about me and not what others say. Number one, I need to do the word. 19% of people in North America read their Bible daily. And then we wonder why we have struggles in our lives the way we do. It's like eating every so often and expecting us to have health in our bodies, in our physical bodies. And if I'm only reading the, the word of God 19% of, of the church, and this is not for anybody to feel bad or to feel condemned in any way, it's just an awareness for us that God's word has gotta be constant mealtime in our life because it mirrors us. The more that I stay in the word, when I walk away and go to work and somebody incites a situation, I remember who I am. When somebody calls me names and people do things to me and people are trash talking me, I don't go to this mirror, I remember this mirror because you could say whatever you want. Do you know when people call me names now and it happens every so often, you know what I do? I just laugh. You could call me brown, white, cream, whatever lover you want. I just go, are they speaking to me? Because he who lives in me is more of an awareness than he who is outside of me. Amen. Do you guys catch it? I know that might sound weird. Uh, you know, and I just shake my head and I go, you really don't know who you're talking to. Now, that doesn't mean I don't want to lay a beating on their head. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. Depends how big they are. <laughs> then I call guys like Aiden and a few of the... Uh, Jew no, no I'm, I'm, I'm just joking. <laughs> We need to do the word. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 and 29 says, we're to love our neighbors as ourselves. Who's my neighbor? Everybody. Just touch your neighbor and say, you're my neighbor. Now, for some of you, that might have been a little bit weird. Maybe you don't know the person. Maybe you've never touched another person of another race. I don't know. I'm glad you can laugh about that. That's good. Love our neighbor as ourself. But what happens if I don't love myself? Then we need some word therapy. We need some Jesus therapy. We need to get in God's presence and allow him to, to just infiltrate our hearts and our lives. We need to get in the word. You know, and I'm going to give you just a few scriptures under this point. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 says, Think of others better than you. 
Think of others better than you. You mean that brother who's from a different culture and different skin color is better than me? Well, Bible tells me they are. And I now need to, now to treat them better. But you don't understand what neighborhood they come from. You don't know what their people have done to me. You don't understand. Treat them better. Because that's what the word says. And I know for some people, you might be here and go, look, this is my first time at church. It's like, whoa. I thought I was going to get like a Jesus loves me. This I know. Yeah, Jesus does love you. But we're getting to the root of some things. Romans chapter 12, verse 14 says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Just at that moment, you want to say something back. That's why verse 26 talks about. And you need to have conversation with yourself. Say, Holy Spirit, just shut me up right now. Shut me up. Just shut me up. Do whatever it takes to shut me up in this moment. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Pray for your enemies. Woohoo! I get to pray for those people that don't like me, that say nasty things about me, that have done generation of things to my culture and my people, and I get to pray for them? Yes! Because that's what a believer does. You might be thinking, this is the craziest sermon I've ever heard of my life. It ain't my words. Jesus wrote them. Now, you might not believe the Bible is true, and that's okay. You might remain stuck and angry, but Jesus came to set us free. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 says, make allowance for each other's faults. But I don't like this about that culture, and I don't like the way they do things. Well, too bad. We're different. Something we need to accept and get over. But the Bible commands us to love one another. Actually, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, it says this. If someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or a sister, the person is a liar. For we don't love people we can see. How can we love a God whom we cannot see? I want to invite the team to come up. God is working in each and every one of our lives in this room. Aren't you grateful for the grace and mercy of Christ? The cross. I have so many blind areas in my life. My wife makes a list and just reveals them every once in a while just to make sure I'm ready. <laughs> but in this area, when it comes to anger, it's not just a situation we look to. Usually that anger gets barfed on people. Some people you know, some people you don't know, some people you interact with, whatever it is. And if you remain there, you will be stuck. Think about that. Stuck. But God's blessing my life. Yeah. We serve a gracious God who doesn't wait for us to be perfect to do things in our life. Isn't that amazing? All the blind areas, all the issues in our life. And God just... Because we're his children and says, you're a work in progress. It, it's okay. We're going to work on one thing at a time. Like a chisel. Going to chisel. It's interesting in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, when it says, if someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or sister, the person's not. That word hate in the original Greek breaks it down to as simple as somebody giving someone else attitude. Cold shoulder. Coming to church. Maybe a breakdown in communication. You walk in, you praise Jesus. You see each other on the way out and you're like, Phew. I'm gonna talk to them. I'm gonna walk down this aisle, not that aisle. The Bible says, break it down to the original. Hate, cold shoulder. How many, you know something? But you know, when I studied that, I preached something very different a number of years ago called what's love got to do with it. Love's got everything to do with it. Not treating people coldly. Loving, not harboring bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness. We need to avoid unfruitful, angry rants. Verse 26. Number three, we need to look after those in need or distress. Verse 27 specifically focuses on orphans and widows. It's interesting. The Bible talks about in chapter 2, but it introduces at the end of chapter 1 people that we would view as marginalized and discriminate against. Orphans and widows. 
The Bible is very clear and tells us that pure religion is taking care of them. Suppose if we were to look at Scripture as a whole, that we're commanded to take care of each other. Oh, hold on a second. The Bible told me to love my neighbor as myself. So if I take care of me, I, I want to take care of you. But the selfishness and the wickedness of our heart keeps us from doing that. So today, I believe God wants to do a couple things in our life. Number one, if you've harbored any type of angry attitude of hatred, bitterness, and resentment, or anger, or grudges, it's time to let go. Racist ideologies and mindsets, language, those people, whatever it might be. Secondly, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to bring healing in people's lives that you've experienced hurt on a number of areas. Maybe just not injustice and racism. Maybe it was a breakdown in a relationship. Maybe it was betrayal of a son or a daughter, whatever it is. Maybe it was a boss that fired you unjustly. Maybe people judged you based on what car you drove, what house you lived in, what shade of skin color you were based on where you grew. I'll never forget, I was with Pastor Philip Godot at a uh, pastor's conference a number of years ago and he's very, very fair skinned. He was mixed white and black and he said, I grew up in a neighborhood where I was the lightest kid in my neighborhood. And he says, constantly the other black kids would say, hey, where's the real Philip black kid? Like, you see, society views this so differently than we do. Why? The filter, the mirror of God's word softens, transforms my heart so I think, live, breathe, and act like Jesus. It's the only thing that will take a wicked heart, a hard heart, and soften it so that he can write on it. Stand in this place, please. With every head bowed and every eyes closed in this place. I believe God wants to do a work today, but are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to let go of what you've heard from your forefathers? Are you willing to let go from experiences that have hurt you and caused you great anger and pain? Because when it really comes back to Scripture, we need to understand that man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And that's why faith has to intersect anger because faith comes by hearing and hearing God's Word. And I need to keep the mirror of God's Word in my life before me at all times. So today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity. You might say, Pastor Jay, today, you know, there's a number of things going on in my life, but today I know that I need to get my heart right with God. There have been things I've been holding in my life. I've never given Christ the opportunity to become my Lord and Savior, and today I want to. With every head bowed, just lift your hand. Who are you? I want to pray for you today. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, thank you. Many hands in this place. Thank you. Secondly, I believe that God wants to do a healing work in you today. But we've got to surrender. So how many of you would say today, Pastor Jay, please pray for me. There's things in my heart that I'm wrestling with in the area of anger and I need to let go and I need God's help today. Just lift your hand in this place. God sees you don't need to be ashamed. Let's just all lift our hands in this place. We're gonna just sing this song for just a moment. And I want you to sing this in faith today. And I'm gonna close in just a moment. I believe. this prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. Right now I acknowledge sin in my life and I want to turn away from it. So I ask you right now to please forgive me of my sin. 
I ask you to remove everything that is in between me and you. Make me clean. Set me free from pain and hurt. And help me to live a new life that pleases you. So I surrender my heart to you today. I surrender my life. I surrender my anger. And I ask you today to please heal me and help me every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Before Pastor Reed comes in one second, I want to share a quick story with you. I'm going to do something a little bit different before Pastor Reed comes. Five weeks ago, I had hernia surgery. I was in the hospital for four days. And the doctors laid out a very specific plan of what to do or not to do. So last week, I went to the gym. I work out in the gym three or four days a week. I haven't been able to go. I followed the doctor's orders. And I don't know what happened or what I did. I had to call the surgeon this past Monday and said, Doc, what's going on? I followed everything you told me to do. And I'm in worse pain than I was than four weeks ago when I had the surgery. Like, what is up with that? And he says, you know, Jason, you know, because, it, you know, it really takes up to a year to get completely healed. Outside looks good, but inside, there's a lot going on. He says that normally people that become active again experience pain for a number of months. So you've got to take it easy. You've got to pace yourself. Don't push yourself too hard, but understand it's part of the process. So why am I saying that to you? You've made a decision today to follow the prescription. Follow the outline of what God's word says. And you might show up to work tomorrow and you've had a great devotional time in the morning and you determine I'm not gonna be just, you know, I'm gonna be one of those 19% and we're gonna get that number up and get God's word in and then something happens with the boss or a coworker and you're just like, what happened? Well, John chapter 10, verse 10 tells us the enemy comes to steal, the thief comes to kill, steal and destroy. And it might hurt for a while. It might, uh, you know, that process might take time for your emotions to catch up to what God's word says about how we're to live. But right actions will always reap your emotions catching up at some point. Don't give up. Get people to join with you, to believe with you, pray with you. But today, can we just join hands in this place? Pastor, you're up here already. Pastor, come up here. Just... We are a multicultural church. And I believe that we were just on the cusp. We are just on the forefront. Because I know Pastor Randy and Jill's heart, Pastor Morgan and Pastor Vera's heart was to see people from all nations come to this place. And we have got to be a place that is not superficial, but a place that is completely authentic in our relationships. I know there's hesitations and misunderstanding and personal ignorance to some time and fears that keep us from interacting with people from the different cultures. But we've gotta be a place that determines fear will not hold us. That intimidation of society and how they view this will not hold us. We've gotta be determined that we will completely be lovers of each other because God, that's what God commanded us to do. So in this place, I believe that this is a defining moment that we have in our individual lives and as a church to say yes to surrender, yes to God's word, yes to saying that this is a place where everyone belongs regardless of the shade of their skin or the country that they've been born in. Pastor, we lead us in prayer today, please. Our Father, we thank you, we bless you, we praise your name. We thank you that you first love us. Yes. Lord, you not only love us, but you gave. Yes. And by faith, we believe, we receive, and we have eternal life. So, Father, we thank you for what you have done. We thank you for the example that you have set through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that your life is entwined in our life, O oh Lord, that we are one. There is no difference. Yes. by the color of our skin by what we do in life by our education I thank you oh God that we are united with you through thank Christ you, Jesus, Jesus. Yes. and I thank you oh God that whose son sets free is free indeed yes. and Father we thank you Lord that we can draw strength from you yes. we can be, be victorious over the things of the enemy because we are more than conquerors yes. through him who loved us and gave himself for us 
So Father, I thank you that we are free indeed today. Yes. Because we draw strength from you, O oh Lord. Thank you, God. And I thank you for the unity that we have in the body of Christ. So Father, we thank you, we bless you, and we praise your name. Because you are our God. You are our Father. Yes. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Remain st your, standing put, for Pastor Reed to give put your hands together and Thank you, Pastor Jay. Thank you for encouraging us today. I just want to remind you of a few things before you go. There, um, I was with Rohan Harrison on, on Saturday, and there are a number of things that needs to be done outside. You know when you have your garden? There are a number of things that you have to do to winterize it, to prepare for the winter. So he would, he's seeking some volunteers. If, so men, if you have some time on Wednesday, starting at 6 p.m., he will be here so you can work with him. Also on Saturday morning at 9 a.m., if you have some time, please come and be willing to work with Rohan as well. Thank you so much for volunteering. And thank you as well for watching via the Internet. If you have your prayer request, please let us know. And for the, give, the giving kiosk will be open immediately following the service. And if this is your first time with BCF, please join us at BCF Cafe just in the lobby. Some of our leaders will be there to be with you. In way of announcement, your connection cards, please leave it at the door. And family night is coming up. Family night is what we do. We celebrate with the children. We don't believe in Halloween, so we have a time with the kids. We're looking for volunteer and Operation Christmas Child boxes, boxes that you may have taken to replenish, to put some stuff in it. Please remember to return it. And this morning, for the men that are here, strong men, we want to take the chairs up. We're going to stack them nine high. We need to take the stage down as well. Lift your hands with me, please, as we close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for what we have received from you today. We thank you for your life in us and through us this day. We thank you that you are God alone. You are the God who is in us. And you are the Emmanuel, the God who is always with us. So when we leave this place, we don't leave your presence because you are always with us. Your goodness and your mercies go with us everywhere we go. Empower us, O oh God, as we leave this place to in the marketplace at work. I thank you that wherever we are, we are the aroma of Christ. We bless your name. We praise you, Lord. And we just pray blessing upon each and every one today. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. No weapon formed against me shall